Two of the biggest races in the U.S. happened over the weekend. Plus, we're speaking with Phil Sims, who has recently let go from CBS and his son, Matt. It's Monday, May 6th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Dan with a Kentucky Derby as an 18 to 1 underdog. Through some combination of the excitement of the 150th running and the steady growth of legalized sports betting, Churchill Downs reported a record $321 million in wagers from all sources on Saturday. For the entire week, betting hit $447 million, and the Derby itself accounted for just under half that, at $211 million. The Derby is just one of 14 races that happened on Saturday at Churchill Downs, and there are others earlier in the week, namely the Kentucky Oaks on Friday. Gambling has been part of horse racing for over a century, and it is fully baked into the business model. Now the rest of the sports world is trying to adopt that same normalization and celebration of betting without the outlandish hats and fancy dresses and suits. While the Kentucky Derby exists on a cultural island from the rest of the sports world, it helped maintain legal betting in American sports through generations of it being prohibited elsewhere. Max Verstappen dominates Formula One, but the driver is only half the equation. The car matters at least as much, which is why pairs of teammates are almost always next to each other in the F1 standings. Recently, Verstappen was asked for a hypothetical salary of 250 million euros, or 269 million dollars. To that, he replied, 250 million? No, I'm happy with what I'm earning already. If you're driving for P5 or P6, you get quite grumpy. It's always about performances at the end of the day. Everyone knows that, and Toto also knows that. Toto, of course, is Mercedes boss Toto Wolff, who is losing living legend Lewis Hamilton after this year to Ferrari because Ferrari has the best chance of catching Red Bull. While Verstappen doesn't sound like he's going anywhere, the same can't be said about other key members of the Red Bull team. Top designer Adrian Newey said he'd be leaving Red Bull after this year, and McLaren boss Zach Brown said he's been receiving an influx of resumes from Red Bull employees, which he attributes to the drama at Red Bull stemming from allegations of inappropriate behavior toward a female employee from team boss Christian Horner. Horner was cleared by an investigation in February, which the employee has appealed. Verstappen's father, Jose, and team senior advisor, Helmut Marco, have been publicly upset by the entire incident, and Jose said the team was in danger of falling apart. All is well on the track for Red Bull, but behind the scenes, it's a lot murkier. And Ipswich Town, nicknamed the Tractor Boys for their rural home, was a third-tier English soccer team last year before winning promotion to the championship. On Sunday, their 2-0 victory against Huddersfield secured another promotion, and they'll be headed to the Premier League next season for the first time in 22 years. The Premier League is still dominated by the richest teams, but the Tractor Boys rising up from the middle of the pyramid is the sort of story that people will point to when they talk about the beauty of promotion and relegation. They'll be joined by Leicester City, who saw the flip side of ProRail last year when they were sent down just seven years after winning the Premier League. Sheffield United, Burnley, and Luton Town will be relegated from the Premier League unless one of the latter two can catch Nottingham Forest in the last two matches. All right. I'm joined now by former NFL quarterbacks and co-hosts of the Sims Complete podcast, the father-son duo of Phil Sims and Matt Sims. Welcome, Bill. Welcome, Matt. Hey, thank you, Owen. Yeah, good, good to be, be here. here. You, Owen, unfortunately, got to hear yeah. the, the talk before the show and just he couldn't get us shut, to shut up. So, you know, we're just... We're glad we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I'm hitting record, guys. We're going. Are you ready? <laughs> I got to get the barbs yeah, out right. early. Get this is the chill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. all good. Well, yeah. Now, now, all serious talk from here on out. Uh, so <laughs> joking. Uh, Phil, let's start with the most recent news. You're you're out at CBS after right. 26 years. How are you processing the news, and, and what's next for you? I got to tell you, I'm mad as hell. So, <laughs> 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 by God. Uh, no, you know, look, it, it, it wasn't a great surprise. So I knew that was probably going to be some change or thought there would be. So that, I think that makes it a little easier. Uh, would I like to keep the job? Of course. I mean, damn, I, I didn't like it. I loved it. You know, get to talk football and hang around. And, you know, maybe when the, we go to commercial, you get to really <laughs> say what you want to the guys that you're working with. But, <laughs> you know, in the meetings, everything. But it was it was a fun job, great job. And, uh, you know, it's just move on to something else now. Yeah. Um, and, and is there a particular reason you think media companies are having their, their big public names uh, get younger at this particular moment? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, yeah, I think always they're looking for the next person. And um, and I understand it's like the NFL, you know, no matter what you do in the NFL as a player, you know, they're going to judge everybody out there and they find somebody they want more than you for whatever reasons it is, then they'll move on. So. There's really not much debate to it. Nobody asked me, talked to me or anything like that. 
Um, I waited for, I guess, a couple months or over a couple months to see what CBS was doing. And I think the longer you know you wait, the more you know it's not going to work out in your favor. But uh, like I said, kind of expected it. Uh, so I'll deal with it. And hey, I, now I just get to send more quality time with my son. I mean, you know, there we go. Just can't beat that. I mean, I don't know. Owen, listen, I don't know if you listen to many of the podcasts, but somewhere in life, he became the father and I'm like the damn son. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I take I take orders from him. So yeah, Matt, tell me about Sims Complete. Um, you know, what what can listeners expect? Yeah, I mean, I think you 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 can encapsulate it and just you can see the obviously the generational gap in our show, right? And just how we're both former players, you know, and and that's the thing too that I think is really fun and interesting as well. And, and uh, of course, the the father son dynamic of it, uh, you know, gets really fun with our banter because, uh, you know, my father, of course, you know, he's always been there and a great mentor to me and. You know, I think our family as a whole took, you know, him losing his opportunity at CBS harder than he has because, you know, we we grew up seeing Big Phil on TV like that every weekend. You know, we knew every weekend he wasn't going to be there. You know, we we tune into Sunday saying like, yeah, let's put on Big Guy. Let's see what he's got to say about the, the, the Ravens game or the Kansas City Chiefs game and all this. And, you know, we're like, oh, yeah, hey, I gave Big Phil that note and he just used it on the show and kind of took it for himself there. but. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, yeah, that's right. But I think it's something that like our family, uh, as a whole, we're hurt by that, of course, because we know how much he loves this game, how much time and effort he puts into it. Uh, you know, how, how just, he really does his homework each and every week. And, you know, selfishly, I'm excited now to be able to share all of his, his wisdom and his guidance and experience in the years of media and covering football and playing football and selfishly get to have it on, on Sims complete just to myself, you know, to, to share it to the world. So uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us. The banter is great. You know, our show is a, it's a little bit of like a field of dreams action. You know, it's just father, son kind of playing catch talking about the game that we love while also ripping each other from time to time too, by, you know, uh, stupid father comments or, or silly son comments that we make to each other. <laughs> Owen, as I've found out, it, you know, you hear right away when we do the show almost every week, the generation gap is there and, you know, that's all cool. It's so we that we do have a lot of fun with that. And it's it really is fun. Matt's got some mouth on him. So, you know, I, I want to hear it. <laughs> and, uh, but I think, you know, the great thing is, you know, as you do podcasts and everything you're doing, Owen, that there's just it's more freedom. And I can we can convince for five straight minutes and not say anything worthwhile about NFL football or sports. But then when we dive into it, the great thing is, which I've already found out and already knew, that the freedom is uplifting, makes you feel great, and uh, you can just really elaborate on things like you can never do in TV. Except maybe if you work for TNT and that when they got 30 minutes, just free, no commercial, just talk, guys, whatever you want to do. Charles, make fun right, of me. When you hire Barkley and Shaq, you know, you know what you're getting. <laughs> yeah. G give me 30 minutes with somebody for no commercials. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll light it up too. There's always, a, there's just so many things you can't get to. I mean, come on, Owen. I know you watch the show some. Do you think I would ever run out of barbs for Boomer Esiason? Do you really think I like, oh, I don't know what to say today. He's no, it's it's a long list every week. Just which one do I want to pick on? TV, I think, is in this interesting moment of you're not really there to get informed. If you're watching a show like NFL Today, you're not thinking like, oh, well, what happened in the, the football games this this past week? Um, you're there kind of for that banter that you get in a podcast. I think TV is moving toward a sort of podcasty direction and that you want this sort of friendly banter relationship with your hosts. At the same time, like you said, you don't have an hour or even half an hour. You've got, you know, a few minutes to, to get your points in and move on. Oh, oh definitely. And um, I think that's a hard thing to do, though, on network shows is to get it in and get the feel of a podcast because it would be... You know, it's just all over the place and you try to get it, mm -hmm. you know, listen, the, at CBS and they do it at Fox. I watch their show every week. Usually on Mondays, I tape it just to see what they're saying and see if somebody says something that I didn't know. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's got to be tight. Your comments, you can have a little fun, but that that's hard to do, too, when you're trying to make a comment and really educate 
the viewers. That's to me, that's what I always felt my role was to get rid of a narrative that's just not true and tell the truth. And um, I, I love doing that. That was my favorite part. And hey, let's get into some football topics. Well, well we got you here. Um, this isn't, you know, the, the breaking news at this point, but it's still in my head. I haven't gotten to talk to anyone yet on the show about this. The Atlanta Falcons. I'm, I understand signing Kirk Cousins to $180 million. I understand drafting Michael Penix Jr. I don't understand doing both of those things. Can either of you explain what they're thinking? Yeah, I, ha I had Michael Penix as my number two quarterback. I'm a former Atlanta Falcon as well. I was coached by Raheem Morris uh, down there in Atlanta when we were part of that Dan Quinn, Kyle Shanahan uh, you know, coaching tree where we went to the Super Bowl and lost, you know, unfortunately to uh, Belichick and Brady and, you know, one of the most historical Super Bowls in history. But, you know, I think just to kind of peel back the onion on, on what the Falcons were thinking is in the state of where football is now in the NFL, you know, to double down at the most important position in the game of football with arguably one of the most talented throwers of the football that we've seen in the draft really in the past few years, you know, and unfortunately for Michael Penix, he was paired with a guy like Caleb Williams in the same draft, who is also one of the more talented throwers probably since we've seen since Patrick Mahomes, but you know, for Raheem Morris and them, like how can you pass up a player that is that talented of a thrower and to say that we're going to have the best thrower of the football playing home games in a dome, you know, one of the road games in New Orleans in a dome and say that that's not a great advantage to us knowing that our guy is one of the best passers and thrower of the football on the field. And not only that, but just, you know, a very experienced player, someone who's been through a lot of adversity, right? Very talented, probably can play sooner rather than later. And I think the question mark too of just maybe what is the longevity of Kirk Cousins, right? And his injury right now, where is that? process is he getting better is it been delayed are there concerns in that regard but also big picture there's no greater motivation now for Kirk Cousins to perform and do well because yeah he may have the dollars and cents but it always makes sense for the business of football to push whoever is out there right with someone that's younger and talented like we just alluded to with the studio show that's what the Falcons are doing right now in their quarterback room they're saying hey you're great we paid you a lot but Michael Penix, he's ready to go, and he's cheaper too. You know, oh, and he kind of says it all. I, but here's what gets me. Everybody acts like that the Atlanta Falcons were one play away or one player away from winning the Super Bowl, and they're not. Hey, look, they can make the playoffs and all that. Do I think they can win the Super Bowl? No, even if it all falls for them in the right way. If Kirk Cousins stays healthy and has a really good year, I, I just don't see him getting to the championship game or anything like that. It's a rebuilding year, a new coach. Uh, yes, we'll see what. But they, like Matt said, they really protected themselves. An Achilles injury, age, the contract. Look, if Kirk Cousins can be the starter for two straight years down there, uh, that's going to say something. In other words, man, do we go for a third year? Do we turn it over to Michael Penix, who we know by then, if he's not ready, then you made a huge mistake uh, drafting him at number eight. So I kind of agree with Matt. A lot of these things, Kirk Cousins is a man. He's tough as hell and physically and mentally, and he's going to have to show that toughness mentally to get over the fact that everybody it doesn't take long, as you know, Owen, in the NFL, we want to see the other guy, the young guy. Oh, the guy we drafted. And if he plays two bad games, we'll get him out. We need to draft somebody else. I mean, that's just the way the NFL is right now. Yeah, and a year ago they had no quarterbacks, and now they have two. So good for them. <laughs> I just, yeah, you know, why why do both of those things? I, you make good points. I'm still a little confused. You have limited resources. You only have that one pick. Our opinions, the, what we're, we have just said, is not what everybody's out there saying. Everybody, I watch, you know, unfortunately, and I just I watch a lot of TV, and I would say 80, 90% of the opinions are, what were they doing? Well, was it Lawrence Taylor? Was he there? Oh, I don't, I, yeah. No, he was not there. We were thinking about, you know, there's Dallas Turner, but he's still a project and we're going to see where he can go. Let's don't act like he was, you know, just an unbelievable can't miss edge rusher. So, uh, so that, that's, I think we hit enough of that to kind of give you our opinion. I can see you don't like it, but that's the way it is. We had, no, I mean, no, hey, I, 
I don't get to disagree too often, so I'll, I'll take it. Um, another another one I wanted to bounce off you guys. I feel like, I mean, this has always been a thing in the NFL through through every generation, um, but I feel like we've got this new iteration of this tension between the league and its players around um, player health versus the league's ability to max out on having basically the most popular thing in America, that being the NFL. Um, and we're seeing that with talk around the 18th game, which is probably going to happen at some point. Um, also, to some degree with international travel, I think a lot of players really enjoy traveling internationally, but also it, it wears you out to, you know, play in London one week and then in San Francisco the next week. Um, so, and, you know, and then we've got Brazil coming in and other countries, Australia might happen. And uh, do you think, think this is um, going to become a real issue between the league and its players or are they all going to work it out because there's so much money flowing around? Oh, and I'll ask you a question. How much money do you need? And the answer is more. Okay, you need more. And, you know, the players, when you put the money in front of them, they go, well, what the hell? One more game, we can do it. And I forgot which quarterback spoke out and said, I might have been Joe Burrow, said if we're going to do this, he wasn't saying let's don't do it. He said, we're going to do it. Let's get two bye weeks. And, you know, and I don't think, hey, money, the bye weeks, the way these teams now take care of their players during the season, oh, my gosh. I mean, they – they only can wear pads like once the whole year. And then once, you know, in the games, they, of course they do. But the practices, the all the stuff that's at their, at, right at their, t- you know, at their feet, all the things they can do to prepare and get over, you know, the game of football, which is rough. And, you know, these owners are looking at it like, hey, it's there to be had and let's don't turn it down. And I, I think the players are going to go right along with it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting too, just especially too with, you know, spring football now and, and whether or not the owners and Roger Goodell are kind of thinking of that now being as the true developmental league uh, for the NFL in a sense of like, yeah, we don't need preseason. We don't really need to worry about cutting these rosters and getting reps for these guys that, you know, for the majority of it will not make the the final 53-man roster. So I think they might be playing into the fact that spring football might be uh, lasting a little bit longer, you know, now that it's a little bit more stable, the fan base is stable. They've kind of built a product that, that is a little bit more, has a little bit more legs to it now. And now Roger's seeing that as, well, yeah, we don't have to worry about that. Let's just get the best product that we can get out there. We'll have camp, go right to the season, maximize what we can in season. And again, like you said, Owen, just build that portfolio into a national scale, an international scale, excuse me. Uh, and that's where I wouldn't be shocked if like 10 years from now, we really do have a few teams that, that are outside of the states, you know, permanently, you know, and built into that 18 game schedule where it's like, yeah, you're going to go on a road trip and you're going to play uh, the Jaguars in London. And then you're going to play, you know, whoever they're in Germany and that's their home field. So uh, and the, the, that bye week is just naturally built into the schedule that way because of it. I'm a fan. And when there's not football on some nights, I go, what the hell am I going to do? I, you know, I've worked all day, and I just want to sit back, watch the game, and gripe and moan like all fans do about the coach, the quarterback, and, you know, what is – you know, that's – that's uh, so if it's on every night, I, you know, the good thing for me is my wife, I like it too. She, she's never turns the TV. You can't turn it off. I got to, Diana, I got to get up and, at five o'clock to go to CBS on Sundays. It's 12 o'clock and no, there's a college game on. She wants to see the end. I mean, she's not worried about me. I got to see the end. Okay. But yeah, uh, listen, the fans are not going to say there's just too much football on TV. Oh, yeah. And Matt, you mentioned preseason. Goodell, you know, in talking about an 18th game was like, well, you, I don't think we need three preseason games. Uh, he floated two and 18, I guess. Um, um, how? Be, give me a number between zero and three. How many preseason games should there be? I mean, for me, selfishly, you know, th- that's how I made the league, right? That's how I was able to have a six year career is because I got the opportunity to play in preseason and I was able to display the fact that, you know, I was talented. I had a strong arm. I could make a lot of plays with my feet. Uh, I could do a lot with little practice. And, you know, unfortunately for the future of the NFL, uh, opportunities like players like that for me will be taken away because I think ultimately, you know, the, you know, when they look at the numbers, you know, no one's really making money in the preseason in the NFL, you know, and I think ultimately that's what the ownership and Goodell will look at too, is that, you know, tickets are, are half price. We're not even selling out. Uh, you know, we can't create enough of a buzz really to, to create, 
you know, some sort of an atmosphere for our business. So, you know, why do it? Let's just, who cares about a soft opening? Let's just open, let's just do it. And, uh, you know, I think that's, what's unfortunate because again, it's going to take away opportunities like players like myself to make football teams that way. Uh, but also I think this is again, them leaning back onto spring football and, and it's staying and being kind of that driving force for, you know, the repetitions and the experience of some of these younger players who don't make it the first or second time into the NFL. So to answer your question, excuse me, I would say max two, right? And if the NFL could have their way, probably one with a built-in, you know, uh, you're going to camp with another team for two or three days and doing that kind of a process to kind of cheat that preseason. And before we let you guys go, uh, each of you give me one team you see as, you know, a team that's, you know, maybe didn't make the playoffs last year or has been down and out for a little while, but you could see going up on the rise. Wow, I got to think there. Go ahead, Matt. I'll let you. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, it's, yeah, I'll, it's I'll, I'll what? Start. No, Phil. You said I can go, so you wait now, all right? No. Uh, it's what I, what I tell you, yeah. Owen. See, tides is yeah. turn. Yeah. So, I mean. I'm the damn son now. Okay, yes, well, Father. Well, you spoke too soon. You said go ahead, and then you, you backtracked. That the is. Jets would be the team, right? It's yeah, like, it come on. It, it's all or nothing, man. Okay. So, Aaron staying healthy, the defense coming right. through. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously it working out with their first round draft picking, protecting uh, Aaron Rodgers. So it has to be the Jets with all the buildup that we had a year ago. Can they finally fulfill, you know, what they think is their destiny with number eight staying healthy for the entire year and making the playoffs? I guess, you know, I got a lot of things on my mind. I would say it would for me, it's I'm going to go Chargers. You know, mm -hmm. I bought in big time. I love the quarterback, Justin Herbert. They did a pretty good job in the draft. And, you know, Jim Harbaugh, he has a way of connecting to players. Uh, he connects. They love him. They don't like him. They love him. And Christopher, Matt's brother, did a Michigan game this year, and he came back and said, well, how was it? You know, he said, and he goes, gosh, it's amazing how these players love Jim Harbaugh. And, you know, that's a great talent. When you connect with anybody, your, your children, grandchildren, but if you're a coach and connect to the players – then you're going to get the best out of them. And that's how you, you see teams come out of nowhere. Yeah. All right. I like it. Bill Sims, Matt Sims. Enjoy the chat. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. All right, Owen. Thank you. That's it for today. Subscribe to Front Office Sports today and share this episode with the Phil Sims fans in your life or perhaps a Falcons fan who would like to hear someone defend their team. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.